So I wanted to like expand on that previous story there of, you know, COVID and health and like what actually goes into determining whether or not someone has optimal physiological status. You know, there are a multitude of variabilities that play a role in this. And, you know, just because someone has a flat stomach, has a six pack, goes to the gym, eats chicken and rice and kale, you know, takes their vitamin D, all this kind of stuff that doesn't, that's not always going to be guaranteed that they have optimal physiological status. So like some of the places that I am going to start, you know, as a coach is there's some very easy markers you can check. Uh, one of them being HRV. So your heart rate variability is a good indicator of stress. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you exactly where that stress is coming from, but it is definitely an indicator that, hey, you should be looking into what's causing stress. Now, sometimes it could be pretty obvious. You know, you got someone who is training excessively. You know, um, yeah, sure. It could be work. Like you could be, you know, uh, high work demand, boss sucks, whatever, all these kind of things could be adding to your stress. But then if you're also excessively training, well, that's just going to decrease your stress management to handle what's going on at work. Right. So, you know, I would start with like the training. Okay. Am I going to bring my training? Am I going to add food? Stuff like that. Right. Uh, waking heart rate. That's a really big one. You know, that also indicates metabolic stress. You know, a higher waking heart rate means, okay, something metabolically is being stressed to the point that we cannot recover from it. Um, so it, it results in things like metabolic adaptation, oxidative stress, all these kind of things, right? You know, you, you just looking at someone's history is enough. You know, look at their psychological history, look at their environment history, look at their training history, look at their food history, you know, take all the account. Like everybody asks me, like, oh, how do you determine what to do with the person? You just look at their history, right? There's no formula, you know, sure, you could look at someone needs so X amount of protein per body weight. Very generically, that could work, right? But if you have someone coming from a history of like high protein and they're having gut issues, then it's like, okay, well, I might not go the whatever it is, pound per whatever, a gram per pound. I'm probably going to look at, you know, maybe lowering protein and working on fixing these gut issues first, right? So I'm going to take that into account. So, you know, there's a lot of those things that you could check easily. Um, things that I check, you know, things that I've branched out into that have been very promising is, you know, just checking, you know, bodily functions. You ask them about their bowel movements. You ask them about their urine. That'll tell you a story there. Is there undigested food? They're probably having digestive issues, right? The color of their urine, the frequencies, all these kind of things, right? Look at that. You also look at the tongue. Okay. You look at the tongue. If you have white mucosal lining on there, you're probably not producing adequate stomach acid, which means you are not properly assimilating your nutrients and you're having malabsorption, right? Which can lead to a lot of complications. Um, you look at, is there yellow on that tongue, right? That's signs of bacteria. You have high bacteria. You're messing with your gut microbiome, which is your second brain. Um, you know, once again, you're feeding bad gut bacteria, which is causing all this inflammation, all these kind of things, right? Um, you look at jagged edges, swollen tongue, you know, that's signs of immune response. You look underneath, you have distended purple sublingual veins. You know, if your fingernails have lots of white pigment in them and your cuticle thing goes really far up the fingernail, you could probably say in conjunction with the um, distended sublingual veins that you have a glutathione issue, which means you're having trouble detoxifying. Uh, your liver is struggling to detoxify right? Because that's probably a uh, primary function of glutathione is to help with detoxification. Um, antioxidants, all that kind of stuff, right? So you can take a look at those things. Are, are they cold all the time, right? Um, you know, so there's a lot of those factors you can change. Ask about their sleep. Are they sleeping through the night? Are they waking? You know, what time are they waking at? You know, are they waking to pee? Reality, they're not waking to pee. What's you have to determine what's causing them to wake up, right? What happens after a meal? Are they bloating, right? Do they feel discomfort? Do they get sleepy? Do they get energy, right? There's there's so many variables to check into, uh, you know, to determine whether or not someone, just because they're eating kale does not mean that they're healthy. So you can, you can check all these easy assessments, you know, just through questions. All you got to do is ask questions and you can determine what exactly is going on and then break it down. And like some of them might be really, really obvious, you know, most common one is inadequate production of stomach acid. 
And so what this is going to do is, as mentioned, is it's going to decrease the assimilation of nutrients. So you have to work on bringing that stomach acid up, but you have to look at why is that stomach acid not producing enough? You know, most likely it's excessive training volume or excessive stressors, external stressors, right? Could be gut issues because every, like when I tell people that they're stressed and they say, oh no, I feel fine. Like work is Danny, whatever. I'm talking like all factors of stress. So your digestion, your liver, like all these things add stress to the body. Eating adds stress, even though it's super good for you to add stress, right? So there's all forms of stress. So you need to look into that. You need to ask that, right? So very, 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 very easy things to figure out. Now, let's say you've asked all these, you know, and either you're not getting honest answers or you're not getting the answers that help you. You can begin to look into things like blood work. Now, when I say you, I think people need to be, um, I won't say specialized in this, but I guess proper education kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, um, in assessing that blood work, because you could look and like values could be okay, but there's a big, like, there's a big difference. Doctors just keep shifting the mean or whoever's in charge is just shifting the mean, right? Like, you know, saying that it's okay to be running a nine, you know, uh, fasted blood glucose level when in reality it's not like, you know, you run that long enough, that's going to glycolically cover your cells, all these kind of things. So a lot of the means have been shifted. So there's a big difference between like reference range and what is like, you might not get a disease and what is actually functional, you know? So you take a look at iron, they say things like eight IU or whatever it is, is, is okay. Yeah, that's pretty low. You probably want to get up higher than that, you know, to be safe. Um, things like that. So when you begin to assess blood work, you have to look, you can look at homocysteine levels. Homocysteine levels will tell you if you're methylating properly or not. Um, I wrote an article, like a mini article about uh, methylation. That's genes being turned on and off. That's huge, right? You know, that's really important for liver detoxification. Um, I keep hearing everybody going on and on and on about how don't worry about detoxes and your liver's detox. Yeah, your liver's detoxing all the time, but to what degree is heavily dependent on everything, right? And so that is where those things have to be taken into consideration because if you're not producing enough glutathione, sure as hell, yeah, your liver's detoxifying, but to what degree is probably pretty minimal. And you can like assess it via just looking at someone's skin, looking at whether they they get hangry or not these kind of symptoms right so all of those are going to play a role you start to look at thyroid thyroid's a huge one where doctors mess up right you have your tsh so your thyroid stimulating hormone it's essentially just telling like whether you need to make thyroid or not okay that could be okay but then you could have all sorts of other factors free t3 uh reverse t3 total t3 all the t4s thyroid antibodies right all of them tell a message because you could have adequate levels of t3 adequate tsh but you could have high free T4 and now you have to look into why am I not converting? Is it estrogen? Is my estrogen too high? Because that's going to help inhibit the break, the iodine molecules. Is my testosterone too low? Um, all these kind of things. So you have to take all those to account in the blood work. You know, most people probably have high reverse T3, which is an inactive form of thyroid that sits on the cell, like on the nucleus, right? Because when you get stressed, you start converting T3 to reverse T3. So like there's all these things you need to take into consideration. Like a big one would be C reactive protein. That's like your inflammatory marker. And a lot of people like heard someone say once that you want to be over one and it just shows like the lack of education and like the guesswork is because as a matter of fact, you need to be under one for a healthy C-reactive protein marker, right? Um, there's all those kind of things. You know, you look into things like bacteria, like that's a huge one, a ton, all of, no, sorry, not all of us, a lot of us have um, bacterial overgrowth, right? And then we feed into that, okay. Determine how you got bacterial overgrowth. You could do a simple thing, take resistant starch. You know, if you start clearing out a room, you could probably say you have bad bacterial overgrowth because that dominant bacteria is going to feed off of that. But let's say, you know, you don't take that measure. You can look at things like blood work. You can look at iron and ferritin is a good example, right? You can also just test like lymphocytes, and all these kind of things, your blood lipids, and they will tell you. You know, but you take, if you have high ferritin, you probably have a bacterial issue because those bacteria are going to eat that iron, which is going to force your body to go into this, this storage mode where it's going to start storing iron. So think of ferritin as your savings account for iron. So there's all these things to take into consideration of, of like determining someone's actual physiological status. So just because that person, um, you know, eats chicken or rice and they exercise and they're like this symbol of health and they're, you know, have all these motivational speeches and they post their workouts every single day does not mean they're healthy. The age doesn't determine that all these kind of things that they take into consideration, right? So there's so many factors to determine if someone is actually healthy or not. And like, even in this long ass rant, I guess you could call it, I've barely scratched the surface of what, of how to determine whether or not someone's physiological status is optimal or not, right? So please refrain 
from saying things like healthy people when you don't even know that person, you don't even know them on a personal level, let alone a metabolic level, let alone a psychological level, right? So it's very arrogant for someone to say that healthy people are dying from X, right? You know, so take into consideration, take or take this how you want it, whatever. But ultimately, I think we are so, you know, not unified as a people right now that we're just love to argue with each other. You know, and this is kind of just bringing out the worst in us, the worst in this situation. So I hope everyone, you know, can kind of get where I'm coming from with this idea, uh, you know, of asking people, like, do you agree if someone should be commenting that and that they should be providing adequate evidence? uh, Because in my eyes, any person that I have seen make those comments, um, you know, cannot provide me with any significant evidence whatsoever to determine whether that person was healthy or not.